Hello and welcome to day two of Community Media Week here at the Somerville Media Center. Uh, this is the second of five live lunch casts. I'm Jane Regan of Somerville Neighborhood News and formerly the executive director of this great place. And I'm joined by Jason Premis of the Boston Institute for Nonprofit Journalism and, and uh, Dig yeah, Boston. I'm, and I'm with Dig Boston, yeah. Right, so um, today is Tuesday, October 22nd, and actually this is the third day right. wow. of Community Media Week. Um, and time it, flies. Time flies. It also happens to be uh, Media Literacy Week nationwide. I don't Ooh. know if you knew that. I didn't. Yeah, so nationwide, uh, places like uh, Somerville Media Center are having classes, are talking about um, corporate journalism and the corporate media that tries to bombard us with uh, commercially motivated uh, information and um, advertising. And then we try to all fight back a little bit with community media, with classes, with orientations um, related to media literacy, news literacy. So yeah, so here at Somerville Media Center, we bring it all together. Uh, but Jason, you just you just uh, walked in from fresh out of production. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what's going on in your community media world? Well, I mean, this is the on the commercial side where we, we also get ads, but smaller ads. Um, you know, like smaller companies, that kind of stuff usually. Uh, for Dig Boston, you know, which is a weekly newspaper, it's an alternative weekly, so called. For those of you that might remember the Boston Phoenix, it's it's the uh, it's a similar kind of newspaper, but still exists and has existed for 21 years. And my group took it over two and a half years ago. So I do that. You know, we, it's a good deal of work to put out a weekly newspaper. Um, and then I, uh, we, you know, we also have a nonprofit um, that my colleagues, um, Chris Ferone, John Loftus, and myself, uh, started out with four and a half years ago. So um, we do both things. And the nonprofit has its mission, you know, to um, uh, be an incubator for investigative journalism in the region. Um, you know, to raise the money we need to like pay for long form, you know, sort of enterprise journalism, which smaller publications like Dig usually can't, you know, um, afford. Uh, but we also, you know, have an education role and increasingly now a community organizing, community organizing role, which I think we'll be talking about today. So, yeah. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll get to that. So, um, before uh, I go on to a few things um, that, a few of those kind of topics, actually my colleagues here at uh, Somerville Media Center wanted me to uh, mention a few of the other events and activities planned for this week. Uh, first of all, these live lunch casts are happening every day. Yesterday we had Representative Provo and Representative Barber with Joe Lynch, who among other titles, he has he wears many hats. He does. Um, he is president of the board here. Um, tomorrow we've got two of our nonprofit partners are sending uh, representatives to uh, sit down with Erica, Second Chances and Respond, and then also Walter Ness will be coming in. And then later in the week we have other guests. So definitely if you're sitting uh, at your desk and hopefully you're not looking at Facebook, hopefully you're watching us, mm -hmm. uh, or maybe listening, um, or if you're at home, uh, definitely tune in. We also have, um, on Wednesday, there's a SCAT TV throwback show at 6.30 p.m. at Arts at the Armory Cafe. It's a 60-minute uh, public access blast from the past, and I don't know if you knew that, that uh, Somerville Media Center, which used to be called SCAT TV, is right. the oldest community station, I think, in the state. Yeah, I've heard that around around these parts. Around these parts, we <laughs> yeah, might probably probably flog that one to death. Um, it's, a good, it's a good thing to flog. Yeah, and I think it's one of the older older ones in yeah. the in the country. country and of yeah. course, um, Massachusetts is really one of the better states <clears throat> to have a public access uh, station. And we've got great laws here that assure that we still get at least some funding from. Um, cable cable fees, although we do need more funding, and that's one of the purposes yeah. of this week, is to raise awareness about what community media does and can do um, at all the different levels, because we've also got podcasting, we've got a, a uh, we've got an internet radio um, radio station, I guess you would call yeah. it, um, and a lot of other activities and classes. Uh, but we definitely um, need some funding uh, from folks like you. Um, just to finish up with other activities this week, we've got an open house on Saturday from 10 to 1. Um, the Union Square uh, Farmers Market is right outside. Come on, uh, come on in for a tour, some snacks, and there's a live podcast that you can, uh, I think, uh, participate in at 12:30. And then on Sunday, we've got about a dozen local comedians are going to come to do a, com a comedy benefit show to help raise money um, to fund our youth programs and our digital literacy workshops. 
and community journalism, and that's over at One Bow Market Way. Um, it's from 4 to 6 p.m. on Sunday, uh, the 27th. So those are the kind of um, activities that we have planned here. But in fact, even when it's not Community Media Week, it's Community Media Week here at Somerville Media Center. There's always something going on, um, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, shows in the studio or something happening in the radio studio. There are kids running around with cameras. And then um, I've got a couple of interns doing um, reporting for Somerville Neighborhood News, which we're trying to get back off the ground. Mm. Yay. Um, but why don't we talk about an activity that's coming up that's related to Somerville and related to community media, and it's coming up in a couple of days, and it's actually um, an effort that involves both the Boston Institute for Nonprofit Journalism and Somerville Media Center. Maybe yeah. you could tell us a little bit about this whole effort and the event on Sunday. And I mean on Saturday, November 2nd, sorry. November 2nd, yeah, from 12 to 2. So. <clears throat> The event is called, I'm waving this, this uh, flyer around. Um, you'll be seeing these around town. I don't expect you to read it uh, here on, the, on, on screen, but um, it's called uh, Real News, Fake News, No News, Reviving Local Journalism in Somerville. Uh, and uh, we're doing this over at, again, on Saturday, November 2nd, from 12 noon to 2 p.m. at Once Somerville, you know, great club. Many of you have probably been there uh, at 156 Highland Ave in Somerville. And... Um, so, I mean, this event is, I guess you'd say, the, the, the follow-up public event to a, a big one that we, we well, that launched a, a whole bunch of organizing on all our parts here citywide um, that um, my nonprofit and Somerville Media Center and other, you know, over 20 other partners, civic organizations around the city um, participated in uh, called the Somerville Community Summit uh, last February. Um, and, uh, you know, my, my group initiated that event because we were, noticing um, that, well, of course, we noticed that nationwide there's been a um, uh, kind of a disastrous downward spiral of, uh, of, um, of local journalism. Uh, we, we've seen um, local news outlets all over the country um, essentially getting absorbed into just two or three, um, well, now two, actually, with the upcoming merger of or ongoing merger of Gannett and Gatehouse um, companies. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing these giant uh, uh, media conglomerates absorbing uh, local news operations, kind of squeezing them for money for some years, gradually cutting uh, the editorial operations over time, you know, cutting staff, cutting staff, cutting staff on, on the editorial and ultimately even business sides. And then um, getting rid of the publications, essentially, you know, once they've every, every bit of value has been squeezed out of it. Um, so, I mean, this process is ongoing and it's leading to a phenomenon that uh, media academics, media researchers are calling news deserts. You know, the idea of, of uh, cities and towns across the U.S. that, are, that no longer have professionally produced uh, news outlets, you know, covering local affairs. And so uh, we believe, we believed, you know, my, my colleagues and I believe that this process was going on here in Somerville and folks here at Somerville Media Center agreed. And so we put the event together, and we really didn't know how many people were going to show up. Originally, we were, we were figuring 50 or 60 people uh, here at the studio, at the, our, the main studio at Somerville Media Center, would show up. But you know, by two or three weeks before the event, we knew that way more were coming. Yeah. It ended up being 130 people. Wow. So we we got once, which graciously allowed us to use their facilities, you know, to um, to you know help us out, co-sponsor, and, and let us cite the event there. And yeah, people really showed up, like in February. On a nice day, even like it was 50 degrees in February, you know. Yeah, I know. I think and, I didn't show up, but I, no, I read no, about no, it. Kind I felt of busy, bad. I think. Yeah, I was. But I mean, but, you know, yeah. to talk about like what news they thought wasn't being covered, mm -hmm. we let individuals and representatives of organizations get up there and speak to 15 professional journalists from the Boston area that do cover Somerville, um, and uh, or want to cover Somerville more, um, to sort of those journalists, you know got up and introduced themselves for like a minute and then sat down and shut up. And then people, one after the other, you know, ultimately I think over 30 people like testified wow. about what was missing. And um, that was powerful. And so um, we were pleased and we were also like, wow, you know, we're a nonprofit and we have a mission, you know, to sort of um, help the furtherance of journalism in the, in, the, in, the, in the service of democracy in America, at least around here. And so we're like, well, maybe Somerville would be a good place to try to reverse 
this downward spiral to becoming a news desert. So, you know, over the course of three, you know, next three or four months, we sort of talked to people. We had some preliminary meetings. We asked Somervillians if there was um, any ideas that they had that might reverse this, this you know, crisis. And um, essentially, people didn't know what to do. And so we were like, well, um, okay, let's try to form an, a new grassroots network. And I, I thought myself, like, well, what's the opposite of a news desert? What might we call this thing that Somervillians would like? And I, you know, a couple things. I was like, well, a garden seems like it would be the opposite of, an, of a desert. And, um, and I know that, that people in Somerville like, like their, their community gardens. Yeah. So people will probably get this concept. So let's call it the Somerville News Garden, you know? And that, people like that. So we started in, uh, in June with our first meeting with about 25 uh, volunteers that we call gardeners, you know, because why not, you know? And, um, <laughs> um, and people seem to like that too. And then over the last few months, we've been um, meeting and meeting and meeting basically, and we've, we've uh, formed four projects within the, uh, the uh, organization, which I can talk about in, the, in a couple of minutes. Um, but ultimately we were like, okay, so we're doing a lot of different stuff. Uh, we need to have a public event. We need to get more people involved. We'd kind of gone to ground, you know, I know that even people around the station were asking, like, uh, you know, what's going on with the Summerville News Garden? Yeah. And, like, and, and we had gone to ground, essentially. We, we wanted to, like, organize with the people we had and really form an organization before facing out to Somerville again and trying to invite everybody in uh, to the early projects that we have that are now well underway. So, um, but we need more information and we need more participation to get more people involved. So we're like, hey, let's call this event and we're going to ask people to essentially listen to a couple of presentations by um, uh, Somervillian, longtime Somervillian, Lynn Doncaster, who's been involved with this effort from the beginning, who's, who's a journalist and many other things and has lived here, you know, for her whole life. And, uh, and also uh, Professor Gino Canella uh, of Emerson College, who got involved with our effort because he thought it was interesting. Um, you know, there are a couple people from, people from out of town involved, and he's one of them. And they're going to give presentations on kind of the local and national picture that I just painted for you, like what's up with journalism and what's, why is it in crisis? And then we're going to break into small groups, which we did not do the first time. It was, the first time was like one big thing. Yeah. This time we're breaking into small groups and we're going to have a discussion. Led, each group will be led, depending on how many people show up, you know, we'll break into groups of six or ten people. And, and we'll talk about um, headlines we've never seen, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and... and think about ways to uh, make sure that news is going to get covered in Somerville going forward based on that conversation. And then, you know, invite people to take, um, be the first people actually to take a survey that we've created for Somervillians. You know, we're going to try to get some more data about like what kind of news do people get about Somerville and like how do they get it, right? right. And then what's missing? You know, what would they like to see? Uh, how, you know, how might, how might people who are taking the survey think about improving the situation? Because we're ultimately after trying to, you know, we're, we're thinking about how the city of Somerville talks to itself and how we can improve that again so that people have uh, the information they need to be engaged, citizens or residents, if they're immigrants, you know, about what's going on around them, to, be, to make decisions, you know, in our still uh, struggling but still democratic society, right? Yeah, I would so. say locally it's... There's a lot of yeah, a lot democratic of aspects, and, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, Even though money is playing an increasingly, unfortunately, big yeah, role. it is. Um, so, yeah, so I think the November 2nd, uh, the November 2nd, that's going to be at 12 at one, uh, at 12 noon at once. And you can um, just go online to the Boston Institute for Nonprofit Journalism website and you'll see an announcement. Go on the Somerville community. We'll go on the Facebook immediate. page. Uh, you know, we have a Facebook page that says real news, fake news, no news. Mm -hmm. You can find that or you can go to the Somerville News Garden Facebook page. Okay. We don't love Facebook, but I mean, it is what it is. People use it, whatever. So we're on there. <laughs> and... Um, um, that's, that's how you can plug into it. You could also drop us an email at Somerville News Garden at uh, binge online, B I N J online, all one word, dot org. So that's, those are two ways. Great. So um, one thing is, is figuring out what isn't being covered. And that's definitely a huge part of the yeah. piece of the puzzle. But then another thing is okay, so. 
who's going to be doing this work? Well, one idea that, that has been around for a long time, um, in fact, going way back centuries, is that, yes, uh, somebody to do journalism, you do need some training. Right. Just like to brush your teeth, you need some training. But you don't have to necessarily have gone to, like, the University of uh, Boston University School of Journalism. You don't necessarily have to have majored in X, Y, or Z. And in fact, sometimes the most interesting um, coverage comes from people who live in a neighborhood, they know who to talk to, people trust them, and all they might, they might just need a few tips on how to take the knowledge and the access that they have and turn it into something that's accessible to others, whether it's readers or people looking at photos or looking at, um, at a video. So, um, so that's, that's um, the idea behind, also behind this event, is to see who um, among the attend attendees um, and or their friends that they might speak to later might be interested in, as a volunteer at first, uh, maybe eventually we can find little stipends, but as a volunteer participating in helping create more content, creating journalism content. And that brings me again back to Community Media Week, because I have to keep uh, <laughs> promoting that. Oh, please. Yeah. 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 And um, just to remind you that if you uh, like some of the ideas that you're hearing about here, and you want to help us do what we're doing, you can, you can make a donation at SomervilleMedia.org. Um, now, one of the th reasons that I'm here uh, today and that I've been around Somerville the last couple of weeks is I used to direct, I was the founder and also the director of this thing called Somerville Neighborhood News. And um, S Somerville Media Center had, was a little more flush in those days, so I had a, I had a three quarter time job. And then the work that, um, the, the, the stories that we produced that were text and uh, video were sometimes uh, run by an, um, Open Source Media, Open Source Boston? Open Media Boston. Open Media Boston. My former publication, yeah. Right. Um, and they were picked up by the Somerville Journal, the Somerville Times, um, because to be clear, we shouldn't say that there is zero local journalism right. happening here. We're not here. saying that, yeah. There are, there are a couple of valiant people uh, trying to do more with less. So the Somerville Journal has basically one human being. And the Somerville Times, as far as I know, has about one human being, maybe two. Yeah, something like two. Um, yeah, yeah, very, very low budget. And the News Weekly is, I don't know, one or two. Yeah. yeah. The News Weekly. Um, and then there's people who do great stuff uh, on um, neighborhood, various neighborhood um, websites and yeah. um, blogs. Like, I know there's a Winter Hill one. There's different a Different social Square. media groups, yeah, right. for different neighborhoods and communities of interest, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um, well, so We're trying to survey all. I mean, we're trying to That's figure what we're trying to figure out. it all out. out. Figure yeah. out the map, figure <clears> out what <throat> you've got, figure out what's missing, and then find ways that if people want to plug in and get involved, they should. So just to plug my own thing, Somerville Neighborhood News right now, we're trying to revive it and get it going again. Yep. Um, so if there's anybody out there who wants to either become a, a volunteer journalist or maybe they just want to share their knowledge and their story with one of the student reporters that we have, um, that is how a lot of great stories happen. Um, in fact, I wanted to see if we could take a look at one of the most recent uh, videos that one of the students did. It's um, We were at the Honk. Uh, I went with the student. Her name is Stephanie. I went with her to do some reporting on the Honk Festival, but not just, uh, but not just sort of like, yay, it's a parade, but really looking at the social justice um, activism aspect. Aspect. So uh, I hope we can take a look at that video right now. This is online and um, has been shared with a lot of media outlets. Horns. Drums. Costumes. <laughs> but it was not all fun and games. Somerville's annual Honk camp. Festival is also about raising awareness on crucial issues and challenges facing the city, the country, and the planet. An opioid survivor hopes that with Pillman by his side, it will startle people in a force to make conversation. October 1st of this month, it's been six years that I haven't touched a pill. And I want to show other people how they can take that control too. So I'm about to walk this whole parade and stop, and I'm going to share that with thousands of people and show them that they are important and they need to know what's going into their body. He was not the only one with concerns. You know, since, since the 2016 presidential election, the level of distress and dismay among my constituents has skyrocketed, not just because of some abstract political differences, but because of federal policies 
which hurt people. Fighting hurtful policies with music and art brought community empowerment. So if you want to shift people's perspective, you got to do something out of the ordinary. And art's really good for getting people to think about things maybe in a different way than they did yesterday. And yeah, if a bunch of us can dress up and do weird things in the streets, maybe there's a reason for that. There were hundreds of costumes and thousands of marchers and spectators, and everyone made a lot of noise about life and death issues. I'm a professor. We're here with our class, Anthropology, Myth, Ritual, and Symbol. This melting earth cream cone represents the efforts that we want to make to bring attention to the disproportionate impacts of climate change on people of color and communities of color. The theme this year was we all need a home, when is housing for all, sanctuary for all, a healthy planet for all. Will street activism turn into political action? We'll be watching. For Somerville Neighborhood News in Harvard Square, I'm Stephanie Wittenbaugh. So uh, I think we've got a little problem with our uh, video right now, but um, I'm sure you can all hear me. Ah, there we are. There, uh, okay, great. Uh, yeah, so that was, that was um, the first, um, that was actually the first piece that we've had from this revived Somerville Neighborhood News um, effort. Um, when I was around, I think we founded it in 2013, and um, we did, I, we used to do a regular newscast, and each newscast would have about five segments like that. We'd also have interviews, and yeah. we did we did something like eighty different segments. Yeah. Um, and the thing that I I kept track of the general topics, and I also kept track. This will interest you as a sort of an academic and a, what a, a practitioner organizer, <laughs> you know, theoretician that you are. Um, I also kept track of who were the guests, who were the people speaking on camera, and I kept track of diversity of. Um, ethnic and national background. I kept Good. track of diversity of age, and I also kept track of diversity of sort of like, uh, cl I you could say social class, socioeconomic role. So in other words, and I, I, not too many, I didn't want it to be all officials. I didn't want it to be all old white guys. I didn't want it to be all the old white ladies like me. Right. Um, we had certain, I want, made sure that we had segments that were done by youth, for youth, about youth issues. Um, and uh, maybe we can look at one or two of them um, that they really had really uh, great impact. Uh, we had Tufts students reporting about Tufts, but things that had to do with the impact of Tufts on the Somerville community. Um, so even if even if um, the mainstream media, you know, the the corporate media like Somerville Journal was fully funded and had the number of reporters that it used to have, yep. it still wouldn't be do playing the role that community r media uh, can and should play. <clears throat> yeah, we don't want to you sort of insinuate that um, everything was always perfect, you know, in American journalism, including at the local level. It wasn't, you know. The, the reason that there are other papers in the city is partially because that is like the American spirit of competition, of course, and people want to tell their own story their own way, you know, or, you know, tell... Somerville stories in the way of the editors of whatever publication, um, uh, but uh, it's also um, because yeah, when you when you have commercial media, corporate media, there are, there are pressures. Even on smaller publications like Dig, we certainly feel it. It would be a lot easier to like do a lot of you know uh, advertorials, you know that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Like uh, if, if folks ever watch a certain show on uh, New England Cable News, is it, is it still on New the, the Food Show, I think you all know what I'm talking about. It's been on for many years. Uh, originally Billy Costa did it, now some other guys do it. But it's basically all ads. It, oh, like a big, be, long restaurant commercial or something? Yeah, it's ba yeah. basically a series of restaurant commercials with the form of journalism, mm -hmm. but it's just the form. It's not for real. Like they're doing it you know, to make the money. Yeah, so, it's like they call know. sponsored content yeah. or advertorial. It's, and it's, I think, I think it's sort of assumed people will catch on that that's what it is, mm -hmm. but, um, but they don't necessarily explicitly state it, although ethically, you know, I think, I think it should be stated. Mm -hmm. uh, in any case, you know, like um, pay for play can be a thing, you know, in journalism. I think this is one of the reasons why people have come to distrust um, journalists and journalism, you know feeling like, well, you know, it's all a game, it's all, you know, it's mm -hmm. all rigged. 
you know, but the truth is some of it was always rigged, but most of it wasn't. You know, mostly yeah. you got honest outlets, honest reporters, uh, irrespective of whether the news outlets are a nonprofit, uh, and there are very few of those, relatively speaking, beyond PBS and NPR, which are very large, um, and uh, or commercial, you know, um, you still you still have uh, uh, a, a superstructure of American journalism that's that's based on fairness, accuracy, honesty. You know, trying to tell the story the way it is. Um, but you know, um, in a, in a in a town like in a city like Somerville, um, over the decades, I'm I'm sure that the sort of paper of record, you know, uh, like all news institutions would editorially lean one way or the other. Mm -hmm. And then other people felt who, the people who it wasn't leaning towards felt on the, they were on the outs, right? Well, I think that there's that, and there's also the fact that um, there were, there might be a leaning this way and a leaning that way, but there were a, an entire excluded population of, say, uh, you know, recent arrivals, immigrants, old folks, right. the kinds of stories that aren't, if it bleeds, it leads, uh, salacious and or exciting and or covering what the Chamber of Commerce would like you to cover. Right. Um, and so that's, again, why I, I always come back to um, community journalism, although paying for it definitely is a challenge. I, I learned something the other day that might interest you. So one of the most famous newspapers, and maybe one of the oldest around also, in our area is not in Somerville. It happens to be at Harvard. It's the Harvard Crimson. Mm -hmm. They accept masses of money and have spon do sponsored articles. So, huh. for example, Red Bull is one of their I sponsors. Did see that recently. Yeah. I didn't know that, and yeah, they get yeah. they get a lot of money. And so I've thought about like how would I how would I feel about that? What if what you know they they put yeah. at the top they say sponsored content, and right. then they'll write a whole article about I don't know some something that's and there's they never might mention Red Bull, but it might be about I know Red Bull's associated with like the soccer team here the the. Oh, the revolution? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe it'll be an article about the revolution. Right. And then at the top and at the bottom, it might say this, this content is sponsored by Red Bull. And I was thinking, like, how would I feel if, I don't know, the, uh, we're across from the independent. How would I feel if the independent came and said, <laughs> would you, we will give you some money, and you can say it's sponsored content. Would you uh, write about, I don't know, or do a do a TV news package about open air eating and how healthy it is, and you don't have to ever mention the independent, but you have to say that it's sponsored by you, and we'll give five thousand dollars to some real neighborhood news. I, I've been thinking about that a lot. Like, what what would I say? Like, if you say no, I mean, yeah, I mean, how do I you mean, how do you guys feel about that? Just say. I mean, I think cable access stations could can take sponsorship. No, it's more, I'm talking about me, like, as a journalist and as How an editor. How do you feel about it? Yeah. yeah, I mean, what do you... I mean, you... so far, we you know, we've been resisting it. It's yeah. difficult, though, because, I mean, consider, certainly in commercial news, like, the, the and at our, at our level, you know, like the city level, mm -hmm. um, you know, 40,000 circulation weekly, pu you know, news publication in print, you know, and then also about the same numbers online, um, uh, you know, you need a certain amount of, you know, number of ads and a certain amount of money from those ads, like, every week to put a newspaper out and to pay people and stuff. And it's, a, you know, it's a struggle, and um, it's very tempting. Well, the, the other thing I should say, the other, the other negative problem that we deal with is that more and more businesses have been turning to marketing companies who basically just write, you know, often poorly worded press releases and throw them out to, like, every news media or anything like news media that they can find and say, hey, write an article about my client, which is, you know, in essence, it's a free ad for their client. That's, that's what they do. And businesses have been turning to these companies more rather than getting advertising in, let's say, print newspapers or other media as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then of the, of the ad dollars that I think um, a lot of businesses and, and other enterprises are willing to spend money on, um, you know, I think it's digital advertising that they want to spend money on because it seems like more bang for their buck, which I think over time is, is being proven to be false, a mm -hmm. false idea. Mm -hmm. Display ads tend to do better, you know, yeah. for small businesses, certainly in a community like this, in a, you know, in local publications. I think they do get more bang for their buck with that. Um, so, I mean, that pullback in, in, uh, in advertising spending by businesses, especially smaller ones, um, obviously accelerates the downfall of local publications, right. including, you know, publications that once seemed like they had a, a you know, like the lock on, on like advertising in the city, the Somerville Journal. I mean, it's, it's, you know, 
that's no longer the case. Right. I you think know. they have a lot of ads that are regional. So that's, for that's example, exactly right. I was yeah. just talking about this with my colleagues last night. They do, and they even have like a page, like you know, I think many weeks, like begging for ads, like a full page ad yeah. of their own saying. Advertise it probably costs you know, more because you probably can't advertise just in Somerville. There's probably well, I mean, one of the reasons that there are these conglomerates that eat up local publications is precisely for regional and national ads. Right. So they can, you know, they can put it out to you know something like it, as it happens, um, the Gatehouse, which is now you know merging with Gannett, um, they had 130 uh, weeklies and dailies in eastern Massachusetts alone. Mm -hmm. Um, in what they call a mega cluster, I've written about this uh, critically, of course, I and like mega cluster. Yeah, I didn't invent that think term. Makes a few it's a other term terms, hard, I guess. <laughs> and um, and I mean, the reason they do this is 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 one reason is because it's more efficient, right? In terms of, or so they so they feel, mm -hmm. in terms of like uh, getting advertisers and saying, hey, we can deliver these ads to these five communities out of the now. It's not 130 anymore. They they consolidated, you know. A number of publications, you know, uh, so I think their numbers overall are about a hundred mm -hmm. weeklies and daily newspapers in eastern Massachusetts that they own. So they can say, well, we'll do, you know, like Raynham and we'll do, you know, Marblehead and we'll mm -hmm. do Somerville, but we won't do these other ones. Or you can get zones, you know, of ads like this county and that county and whatever. Um, that's how they do it. But I think that um, in general, you'll notice like uh, with print publications, uh, like the journal, um, they physically shrunk. Like yeah. The size of them has shrunk, right, to save money. Um, so the, the real estate they have to even sell has shrunk. Their prices, therefore, have probably, uh, if not dropped, leveled off, you know, year by year in terms of, like, what people are spending to get that space mm -hmm. in the display ads. And they're, of course, very aware that um, with the, the, the move to digital on most people's part for getting at least some of the, their news every day that they're, they're competing with that. And so they're also trying to get digital ad dollars yeah. on their website and others, you know, and their social media properties. But I mean, it's, 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 not, it's not working out. I, mean, like, I think it's a real challenge. I think uh, I happen to live in Cambridge um, <clears throat> where, the, um, where the Gatehouse paper is free. And so I think the Cambridge Chronicle does very well, but the Somerville Journal is not free. And I think it's kind of expensive if you want to pick up one issue. I think it's two fifty or two dollars, or it's quite expensive and to buy a single. And then they have <clears throat> and they have paid subscriptions. Yeah. Now in Cambridge, you can also subscribe. That's but right. if you go to your local market or you go to the library on a Thursday or Friday, you can get the paper for free. So I bet their ads. And those revenue sources are also diminishing. You know, yeah. People, all all the newspapers that you still see, including the Boston Globe, you know, and especially the Boston Herald, which I think is on the rocks now. Mm -hmm. so, you know, it got bought up by another corporate owner, you know, not, not too long ago. And, and they just laid off, you know, copy editors. They've had layoff after layoff after layoff. The Globe keeps cutting. Everybody except um, more multimedia newsrooms like WBUR, which in fact are growing, you know, has been, the print operations are definitely contracting. And here, here I am with my colleagues and I in my publication, yeah. you know, trying to grow, you know, kind of against I think the current. Against know. the current, maybe in like a the local area, but I think nationally and internationally, not necessarily. I mean, we have one of the most commercial, uh, commercially funded journalism systems in the world. And I think that that's always been a problem. Um, before, a long time ago, we used to have the unions had papers, abolitionists had papers, like German Americans had papers, yeah, yeah. you know. Every um, political party, right. you know, certainly and, in the early Republican. And papers. I think that that was, that was great. I think that would be great. Now, we're not in the age of like ch cheap newsprint and subsidized postal uh, fees anymore. Right. But I do think that um, the idea of getting people to see that they actually, we need to pay for information, and so it's a matter of how. Are we going to subscribe to, are we going to become a subscriber to the Somerville Journal, or are we going to give donations to uh, WBUR and WGBH and Boston Institute for Nonprofit Journalism, and of course, to the Somerville Media Center, because it is Community <coughs> Media Week. And don't forget, you can go online and make a donation to summer, at somervillemedia.org. Um, I think that getting folks to realize that you have to pay for something. I mean, you're, you know, I, I'm wearing a blazer. Like, this wasn't free. I had to look look nice. To be a journalist, you have to look nice, right? I wore nice, this right? sweater because I forgot that I was going to be on air. I was wondering about that, today, but so I, I didn't want to say anything. No tie today for Jason and wet hair and all that stuff. So, yeah, I mean,
mean, me, you know, journalism costs money just like gasoline for your car costs money. Um, so I think that that's actually part of the, at the same time as we're trying to promote the actual creation of more um, content of public interest journalism on the local <coughs> level, getting <coughs> volunteers involved and or student interns um, and or directly raising money to pay people like Lynn, like other people who are freelancers in our community. I also think that we need to push this idea that it's it shouldn't be free, it's not free, and that people have to pay for what they what they value. If people spend like five bucks on a latte. Jason. No, this is certainly a debate it's ridiculous. Though, right now. I mean, my, if my colleague Chris Ferron was here, he'd say, you know, that that train has already left the station. And, you know, like if you start, like he, he's very against paywalls in terms of digital news. So he then you think, figure out another thing. You, you have a tip box, box yeah, you have a whatever thing. Whatever it is, right? Yeah. I mean, like you, you figure out the ad problem. You we, Well, what we're doing with our overall enterprise is, you know, our overall operation is we have a nonprofit you know, on one, like that's run by the same three principles, you know, mm -hmm. and then we have this for profit, at least, you know, nominally for profit, a little, little bit of profit uh, operation, Dig Boston, enough for us to like start to grow uh, from where we took it over from our predecessor when we, when we acquired the company. Uh, and they kind of help each other, right? Mm -hmm. Like binge producing and syndicating news for free for outlets like ours, like mm -hmm. Dig, mm -hmm. helps us. Right. Because it's giving us long form journalism that Dig can run, you know, at no additional cost. Right. Paid for by donations right. in the public interest, right? I should also say though, you know, we, we, we need to talk about the commanding heights of digital uh, information, you know, digital news, because this is this is where all the money's going. You know, it's it's not it's not like to um, Dig Boston's website. Like that that's the ads on there are not bringing in the big bucks, right? Because who controls all those ad systems? Those are the companies. So Facebook, Google, Google. especially, you know, Amazon and others are also players. And, you know, Apple, they're all players to one degree or another. But especially Facebook and Google dominate the digital ad market. And, they, you know, they kind of, you know, coaxed a lot of news organizations over the last 20 years as the Internet really became a thing for, you know, for, for news broadcast or, or narrow cast, as the case may be. You know, they, they, they were like, hey, New York Times, come on, come on to Facebook. Yeah, you know, and like, and bring your audience with you. And like, yeah, we're going to kind of monetize that audience. And then we're going to make you pay to reach your own audience, New York Times. Yeah. Once you've brought, and that's, and the same process is happening to publications that are smaller, like Dick. So you can imagine, I mean, we didn't, but we didn't jump in as much as, and I'm not saying the New York Times jumped in to Facebook or whatever the most, but they jumped in, you know, as did all the majors that I'm aware of. And, you know, be that TV news, uh, radio news, print news, they all jumped on the internet bandwagon. <clears throat> and the people, you know, the, the corporations that made the money weren't those corporations in general. I'm not saying they don't make any money, but, you know, we have seen a lot of major news outlets collapse of all types, yep. including digital only, you know, um, outlets have collapsed or been bought out, you know, because they make somebody angry who's rich or whatever. But like, um, they, uh, a lot of these major news outlets did what advisors um, told them to do. Like they're like, a few years ago, there was this turn to video. So even yeah, yeah, print yeah, publications, yeah, yeah, yeah. like the Times, like the Washington Post, like the LA Times, like the Chicago Tribune, whatever, they were all in the Globe, you know, were all like, okay, video, video, video. So suddenly, journalists that may or may not have training in, in video. And these days, I always tell my, you know, my interns, and we have a lot of interns at Dig, and some at Binge too, you know, like, you gotta be a multimedia journalist in this era. Like, if you didn't start off doing video and audio as well as text, you know, print, you need to learn at least to a tolerable standard, like how to produce stories and how to just appear as a personality, right? So these publications, these other news outlets, broadcast or otherwise, go in whole hog to the video thing, even though they, if they'd never done video before. And that, that just cost them a lot of money and didn't necessarily make them a lot of money. Who it made money for was, again, Facebook, Google, these other digital giants that were monetizing the presence of people on their social media platforms in one way or another. Right. That's a whole other conversation I won't get into. Yeah, but, Hoover but and like, So they're that. making all the money, right? And even larger publications like the Boston Globe are, um, well, the Globe does actually rather well with its digital operation. I don't think it followed every fad, you know, so slavishly and kind of 
you know, uh, li sort of set its own course. But still, it's, it's a struggle for them, you know, and they're mm -hmm. still trying to run a print operation. And they wouldn't exist, really, if they didn't have a billionaire, you know, like Henry, you know, uh, John Henry, you know, yeah. backing them, right? Like Washington uh, Post and Jeff Bezos. Publications at our level, at the, at the local or regional, you know, metro level, that are not that big, we don't have billionaires, right, backing us. So, and if we, if we go under, it may not seem like much to people that have kind of gotten out of the habit of checking out local news or checking out Somerville Media Center as much as you might. Um, you know, um, you lose something. Like you lose a lot of information on the ground that you wouldn't get from these larger publications because they can't cover everything. You well, know? I think it's, we've it's, already, we've seen that in Somerville. Uh, there was recently, I think it was in about August, um, everyone kind of discovers, wakes up to discover that this uh, British company has bought this entire block yeah. of Davis Square that has the Burren <coughs> and a lot of other Sligo, uh, right? old, yeah, Sligo and I think um, the meat market McKinnon's. Yep. Yep. Um, and that company um, also owns a building downtown Wait, or a, a site British, downtown. A British company has bought a block with a bunch of Irish businesses. Yeah, what's that all about? I don't know. There's something going on there. Something <laughs> sneaky going on. Yeah. Anyway, um, the thing is, is that um, if we had more city beat reporters covering things in the city, right. it wouldn't have been like, oh my God, look what happened. It would be like, oh, look what might happen. Let, you know, let's get involved. Let's write to our city councilman. Um, let's try to, rather than trying to play catch up ball. Um, now, there's luckily a lot of activism and a lot of really dedicated people in this city. So catch up ball has worked out okay. For example, with Union Square, there's a lot of things I don't happen to like about the um, development uh, that's going to happen here. But um, there's been a lot of great neighborhood organizing. And finally, there's been a, a pretty good community benefits agreement has come out. There's um, Union Square Neighbors Association. But again, this was catch up ball. It was like basically the mayor and city hall and maybe the zoning or the redevelopment authority had like already organized a whole bunch of stuff that they thought were just going to go through. Luckily, um, we have all these community organizations that got involved. And I have to say, I have to credit Somerville Neighborhood News. Um, we did a ton of coverage over community benefits agreement and what's happened in other cities and what's happened in other states. Um, so uh, to go back to this idea of, of the need for more <coughs> and more coverage, quantity. We need, of course, you always want the quality, but we actually need more human beings going into more meetings or going to more events. Um, because it does have an impact. I wanted to pull up an old, um, a couple of old pieces that uh, Somerville Neighborhood News did. Um, I couldn't find the one on heroin, uh, so I can just refer people. If you go on YouTube and you just write in the search engine, heroin Somerville Neighborhood News, you'll actually find a video that was in two th 2013, one of the first media outlets in the area covering the um, heroin and opioid epidemic, happened right here in this building, and it was, um, I think it was like the first episode of Somerville Neighborhood News. It was a student from BU, and she and I were walking around and trying to figure out, like, oh, gosh, what kind of story should we be covering? Um, I was new back to Somerville from Haiti. She lived in Boston. We didn't know that much. We run into Officer Anthony. He's a community police officer. And I said, Officer Anthony, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, do you remember me? I used to be executive director here. He goes, oh, yeah. I said, hey, listen. We're getting this new this local news uh, outlet off the ground, and if you had to cover one issue that uh, that you think isn't being covered enough, what would that be? And he said, "That's easy. Kids are dying. Kids and thirty-year-olds, um, <laughs> mostly some real natives, are dying all over the place of yeah. o overdose, yeah. and the and it's always reported as died quietly in his sleep at home." He goes, yeah. "You've got to look into that." And I was like, "What?" And that wouldn't have happened without sort of this ear to the ground, you know, you know, streaky. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I did find another one I thought would be fun to look at. The introduction takes a couple of minutes. You'll get an idea of what Somerville neighborhood news used to look like, because it was a newscast. Um, and then this is what's called a vox pop, uh, which means vox populi, man and woman on the street. Um, and one of the Tufts student interns said, I want to go up to my campus, and I want to talk to people in and around the campus about what they think about the fact that Tufts does not give financial aid to students who get in who are undocumented. 
and what do you think about that? And so it's a great, that's another role that like local community journalism can play is like really go out and listen to people. So let's just take a look at that piece. Um, I think it's from about 2014, 2015, and um, it's should Tufts give money to undocumented students? I think it's really long, we might dump out of it. Now, let's go up to Tufts. In the past, we've had stories on some of the challenges that undocumented high school students face here in Somerville. What happens when they and other undocumented youth want to go to college? Even though undocumented students are legally able to attend university here, they are not eligible for most state and federal financial aid. Most private universities don't give them grants. But this is starting to change. Last fall, NYU joined the growing list of colleges and universities that want to help undocumented students with grants and loans. The student group Tufts United for Immigrant Justice thinks Tufts should follow NYU's lead. What do students and others on campus think? Reporter Hadley Green, a Tufts student, went to find out. Given the fact that Tufts strives to have an inclusive or diverse student body, um, and given the fact that there's a large immigrant population in Somerville, do you think that Tufts should reform um, their reform the way that they treat undocumented student applications and possibly follow in NYU's footsteps? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I think I do think they should reform their with the, reform their program. Um, I work in Somerville, and I work with a lot of um, immigrants and people who aren't from America. And I know that there are a lot of immigrants in the education system, you know, especially here in Boston. Um, so finding out that you know that they treat undocumented applications as international applications, you know, I understand why they do that. You know, that makes sense. However, I think that with the issue of financial aid not being able to get federal funds for the applications, that there should be some sort of adjustment for that. I would say 100% yes. I definitely think that Tufts should do this. Um, biggest reason being that um, I think what happens is thinking thinking about how education, generally speaking, is considered like something everyone needs to su to succeed and to reach social mobility. And what's happening is that these um, undocumented students or, or youth um, are already disadvantaged being undocumented, probably not having English as their first language, probably coming from poor, uh, low-income backgrounds, and not giving them access to education further keeps them in those positions. And so what happens is, I don't necessarily agree with the idea of like total assimilation, but if we're talking about how immigrants should assimilate and they should do all these things, education is one way to do that. And if you're not allowing them to do that, particularly getting the advantages that come from coming like to an institution like Tufts, then you're purposely keeping them down and you're purposely, purposely keeping them in a disadvantaged position. So um, I also think that if you're if Tufts was really about getting diverse perspectives, that is one perspective that's completely absent from the Tufts campus as well. And that I think, I mean, not only should we be thinking about how do we benefit as a university from having you know, undocumented students on this campus, but really, how are we as a university, as this nonprofit institution, um, keeping um, opportunities for people that could really use it? I mean, it sounds like a good program, but obviously, like, you know, fi financial stuff is so difficult, and you, um, it's hard to say you, where you what, what you're taking money from and what. I mean, if they could get a, someone to, to fund that program, that it sounds like an excellent program. Uh, but at the same time, it's hard to just say, uh, you know, make hundreds of thousands of dollars appear out of the air. I think so. I th right, so that I cut out of that early because it's a little bit long, but that's one of several reports that um, we did on Tufts that actually had, I, I really believe they had impact. I'm not 100% sure, I don't have scientific proof that this one had impact, but there was another report that I did with a couple of students about the pilot, the payment in lieu of taxes. Yeah. And we discovered that um, the deal that Tufts was giving to Somerville and Medford was way less than Tufts was giving to the city of Boston for its Boston real estate. And um, the Somerville Journal picked it up and, and ran it as a text article. And then I'll never forget, I was helping a student cover a city council meeting. And one of the city councilors has the article she's cut out. 
and she's holding up and she's like shaking it and saying how mad she is at the mayor for negotiating this sweetheart deal. And in fact, um, right now the negotiations, uh, the mayor and, and his committee, negotiating committee, are under, they're sort of stuck between a rock and a hard place because the, they're getting a lot of pressure from the community to get a better deal out of Tufts and then Tufts isn't budging. Well, that's a whole, actually I'm going to do a story on that next week. But um, local community journalism where you talk, you know the people to talk to or you, you know, like I can talk to Jason and Jason will tell me who to talk to, you know, say it's yeah. a labor issue. I mean, there is <clears throat> nothing that beats it. I will take that kind of story over something written by someone from the Boston Globe or some other paper who oh. sort of parachutes in. <clears throat> Um, yeah, so um, anyway, if you want to go, anybody's interested in the old stories from Somerville Neighborhood News, you can find them uh, on our website, which is Somerville Media um, slash SNN, um, or you can go to the old YouTube page. We have the old packages. Um, so just as a reminder, you're tuning in to a live lunch cast here at Somerville Media Center. We are in the middle of Community Media Week. We've got a live lunch cast every uh, weekday this week at 12.30 p.m. Um, if you join us tomorrow, uh, you'll uh, meet and be with Erica Jones and some of our nonprofit partners like Second Chances and Respond. On Wednesday night, please come to the SCAT TV throwback show, 35 years, um, little clips from the last 35 years of community television. That's up at the Arts of the Armory at 6.30 p.m. to 8.00. On Saturday, we've got an open house here from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. So if you're out at the uh, farmer's market right out here, come on in, get a snack, maybe participate in the live um, podcast at 1230 um, and have a tour and learn more about what you can do here as far as making media, participating in making media. Again, whether it's journalism, of course, yeah. that's our thing, but also comedy, um, uh, talk shows, uh, working in the studio, whatever you might be interested in. Um, and then to close out the week on Sunday at 4 p.m., we have um, about a dozen Boston area comedians are going to come and participate in a community uh, a comedy benefit show to help raise money for the youth programs here mm -hmm. and the digital literacy program. Tickets are $20 in advance. Um, if you go on to our website, somervillemedia.org slash comedy benefit, or just go onto the website, you'll see some kind of a big box. I'm sure. Um, it's $20, and that is actually going to be at one Bow Market Way. Um, and another important community media event we ought to talk about again. Uh, Jason, you want to? Yeah, can... we have this event coming up again. This is the flyer that you'll see. Am I, we have, yeah, there we are. <laughs> um, you know, I got to read it. Well, real news, fake news, <laughs> no news. Reviving local journalism in Somerville is the event. It's free and open to the public. Saturday, November 2nd, from 12 noon to 2 p.m. at Once Somerville. Uh, at 156 Highland Ave and, and of course, Somerville. Uh, you know, we, we'd love you to come on down. We're going to be talking about, you know, um, how uh, Somerville can, uh, you know, Somervillians can, uh, Im you know, improve the, uh, um, the uh, news ecology, as we call it, improve the amount and quality of journalism, improve the, the number and quality of news outlets in Somerville that cover Somerville. That's the goal because we, we have... We, uh, we, we, we've had some issues in that, in, that, in that regard. Right. And what do they say? Democracy dies in darkness? Well, yeah. I think it also dies if there's, um, if there's no uh, coverage, uh, local coverage. And, of course, I'm always interested in uh, the most progressive coverage possible. I happen to be a progressive person. Um, I've spent, I think I've been 35 or so years as a journalist. And I did dip my toe into the mainstream media waters here and there. And so I'm not going to completely trash uh, mainstream media. I worked for the Miami Herald, the Sun yeah, sure. Sentinel. I worked for the BBC. But um, my heart and my heart lies with uh, community, public interest journalism, local journalism. The more local, the better. Um, and in fact, I, I spent a lot of time in Haiti, but I won't cover Haiti anymore. I've kind of made a deal with myself. I only want to teach Haitians to, to better cover their right. own country. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's the goal with um, Somerville Media Center and is to help uh, push and improve um, community media, get involved in your community media center, come on down, visit us, check out the website. And remember, it would be great to have a donation at somervillemedia.org. And thank you very much, Jason, for coming thank and you. joining us. I'm Jane Regan from Somerville uh, Neighborhood News.